Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome all participants at today's conference on science diplomacy. This is the first edition of our series, Diplomacy Matters, your questions, our answers. First edition after the summer break. I'm talking to you from the Diplomatische Akademie Wien, Vienna School of International Studies, right at the heart of Europe. My name is Susanne Kepler-Schlesinger. I'm the deputy director of the DA and working for and working with science diplomats and scientists has constituted a red thread all over my career as an Austrian diplomat and as an Austrian civil servant when I worked both in bilateral functions and at the United Nations in New York. Dear guests, um, I invite you to welcome with me our special guest of today, Professor Anne Kasper Giebel. She is sitting right in front of me. And um, we are both truly looking forward to an exciting exchange with you, with all of you on science diplomacy. And this is why I would like to encourage uh, all of you to send us your questions in writing to the following email address conference at da-vienna.ac.at you can also send you send us your questions uh, on our facebook page during the streaming without further ado uh, here is our motto for today's discussion science diplomacy, joining forces for sustainable development. Ladies and gentlemen, if we experience the often dramatic effects of climate change on our livelihoods, if we look at the alarming levels of the pollution of the seas and the outer space, if we look at the raging uh, pandemics, widespread hunger, abject poverty and what these phenomena can do to mankind, very, very serious questions come up. Does the global community, including scientists and researchers, have to do better to fight against these global challenges? Do governments have to do better to achieve the set of 17 sustainable development goals adopted by the United Nations. These are, after all, the internationally accepted roadmap designed to give our planet a better and healthier future. I'm sure that we can all respond to this with a resounding yes. Yes, we can do better. We have to do better, not only for us, but also for future generations. Ladies and gentlemen, today I have the great pleasure to join forces with Universitätsprofessorin, Diplomingenieurin Dr. Anne Kasper Giebel. She is a leading and internationally renowned expert on environmental analytics. Professor Kasper Giebel studied technical chemistry at the Technische Universität Wien. She devoted her PhD thesis to aerosol measurements through research at the Sonblick Observatory. This is the highest observatory in the world, located at more than 3,000 meters above sea level. This research institution has been monitoring meteorological parameters and our atmosphere since more than 125 years. And I must admit that I envy Professor Kasper Giebel for this experience because the Sonblick is one of the most amazing places in the Austrian Alps and certainly also one of the coldest ones. Professor Kasper Giebel also conducted research at the Texas Tech University as a Fulbright Scholar. Today she holds a professorship at the Vienna University of Technology and heads its research group on environmental analytics. Her main research interests are related to the clean and the polluted atmosphere. She is also associated with the Austrian Academy of Sciences and the Medical University of Vienna. 
Professor Kasper Giebel is also an important partner in an academic master program on environmental technology and international affairs, jointly carried out by the DA, my own institution, and the University of Technik. Her list of publication is impressive, as is her international network. I have come to know Professor Kaspar Giebel as a passionate professor and also as an ambassador for young scientists. It is in these functions that she opens the hearts and the minds of children, of students, and also of her fellow researchers to the intricate world of micro and nanoplastics, Saharan dust particles, or smoke aerosols and their impact on the air we are all breathing. Ms. Kasper Giebel, I would like to give you the floor for your presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kepler-Schlesinger. Thank you very much for this nice introduction and for inviting me uh, to this interesting conference online event we will have today. I was asked to give my opinion and my thoughts about the needs and the possibilities to join uh, science and diplomacy. And to make the long story short, I'm absolutely sure that we have to join our forces, taking one slogan of the Fridays for Future movement, there is no planet B. In the next minutes, I will give you my uh, thoughts about why and how to join our forces. And of course, I will take the examples out of my research field. My research field is air chemistry, air quality. And why is it important to deal with air quality? The easiest thing to experience that is to stop breathing. If you hold your breath, you will have a problem. You can survive without any food or drink, this talk or the whole conference, but you can't do that without breathing. So please go on breathing and we will go on uh, with my examples. Uh, air quality is a severe topic in many parts of the world. And if you look at the website of the World Health Organization, you find the simple and very straightforward and alarming statements that 91% of the world's population live in places where air quality exceeds the guideline values of the WHO. And 4.2 million deaths every year occur as a result of the exposure to ambient air pollution. Of course, the situation is different in different parts of the world but air pollutants are transported with the winds. And this transport is quite fast and it covers large distances. Uh, the transport is very closely linked to the lifetime of the substances. And to have one example, if we think of particulate matter, the lifetime of particulate matter is several days, the lifetime in the atmosphere, in the troposphere. And during that time, the particles can be transported several hundreds or even thousands of kilometers. This effect is known for quite a time. It was a topic uh, when the phenomenon of acid rain uh, was noticed and the convention of long range transboundary air pollutants uh, reflects this transport and it also states the necessity to work together. And I would say this necessity does not only cover the cooperation of different countries, different nations, but also the cooperation of scientists and diplomats. So we rely on clean air. The concentrations in many parts of the world are way too high than being healthy and transport of these air pollutants occur. We have one world and one legacy. The transport uh, takes place in the clean and in the polluted environment. And if we think about the polluted environment, so regions where the concentrations are close to or above the limit values, then often the discussion starts, what part of this impact of these concentrations is made by local sources and what is caused by the import of 
air pollutants. And this is a very uh, important discussion because reduction measures are the most effective if they are taken at those places where the highest emissions occur. But still, one should bear in mind that all emissions contribute to the overall background level. And this means that lowering all of the emissions is necessary to get that background concentrations down. Then I want to have some words about transport in clean environments. And here I come back to the Somblik Observatory already mentioned today. This really is a unique site in the Austrian Alps. And there you find transport phenomena, you find timelines, a number of national and international groups work there for air chemistry. And they give you timelines about anthropogenic pollutants, like the precursors of acid rain, acidic gases. Then we have the microplastic there. We have emerging pollutants like persistent organic pollutants, industrial chemicals. Uh, produced for use in special goods and also household goods. So you find those concentrations. You find wildfires. And there, it is a combination already about anthropogenic pollutants and natural contributions. And then we can also switch to mineral dust transported to this alpine environment from the huge deserts of our globe, mainly from the Sahara for the Somblik. Why do I mention those natural contributions? The air quality at that site will never be uh, in a state that it could impair health of people being there, mountaineers, for instance. But it does affect the ecosystem. You have a nutrient input. You have uh, changes in the alkalinity of the snowpack. These changes might be beneficial or not. Yeah. Uh, you have changes after the dust was deposited on the glaciers in the albedo, which could lead to an earlier glacier melt. And still remaining airborne, you again have those radiative effects, or the formation of the precipitation could be changed because the dust acts as a nucleation uh, cloud or ice nucleation. So on the whole, we need to consider anthropogenic and natural pollutants to understand the processes in our environments. And we need to communicate them, not just to the scientific community, but to other com uh, communities, to diplomats, for instance. Uh, the need for those measurements is also reflected by uh, an European research infrastructure, which is established just now. This is the ACTRIS uh, research infrastructure, and uh, it fosters measurements for short-lived air pollutants like aerosols, trace gases, and clouds could be. But now let's go back to the polluted environment. Until now, we just thought about transport, airborne transport. But the current habits of production and use of products led to uh, an interesting point. The import and the export issue was shifted to the consumption of goods. And this leads us uh, directly to the sustainable development goals. Air quality is related to a number of goals. And for some, it's more um, obvious. If we think about SDG 3, for instance, health and well-being, their air quality is a topic. SDG 11, the sustainable cities, also has a close link because particulate matter concentrations in cities are considered. The link to climate action, SDG 13, is straightforward also. But the point I mentioned before, that people shift the production processes to other countries and the emissions occur there, and we just consume and use the products then in a rather clean environment. This fact is reflected by uh, the SDG 12, responsible consumption and production. And to evaluate this, uh, one indicator accounts for these spillover effects. And this indicator measures the net imported SO2 emissions related to those goods. And this is a way how uh, SO2 
emissions and concentrations get into the focus of countries like Austria, where we have rather low ambient air concentrations of SO2, one of these classical air constituents or air pollutants. So for the last minutes, I want to speak a bit about the how and not just about the why we should join our forces. How could we join our forces? One example was already uh, mentioned, the ETIA class. When I started to teach there, I asked myself, what is the most important uh, things I would need to know to work in such a foreign environment where my students come from? And I realized that you really should stick to the basics. For detailed questions, you will always need an expert. But you should have some idea about the basics and you should learn the language of the other community and the basic information. So before I start my class about air chemistry and measurements, I have some slides and uh, also experiments about basics like the concept of lifetime. Because the lifetime of an air pollutant directly influences its legacy. Then I have some words about concentrations. We like to speak when we consider persistent organic pollutants, for instance, about very small concentrations. We are at the PPP, PPT level, for instance. But what, what does this actually mean? Thinking of quantities we experience in everyday life. You can show that by just dissolving a lump of sugar in a glass, a bottle, a beaker, a pump water tender, or then in a lake, and so on and so on. This gives you a feeling how small these quantities are. On the other hand, it is impressive to experience why we can detect as analytical chemists this low concentration. And this leads us to the molar concentrations, the Avogadro constant. It's impressive to see and to calculate as a thought experiment, of course, how many molecules of sugar you will find in one liter or one cubic meter of water when you dissolved a package of sugar in all of our oceans. And this gives you a bit of an impression how the other community works and how it thinks. Another thing is about limit values. During negotiations, you have to deal with limit values. The analytical chemist in the lab has a different approach to that. And understanding the concept of the detection limit, that it's never possible to say a compound is not available in a sample. It's never zero, it's just below the limit of detection or the terms accuracy and reproducibility of a measurement is, I would say, very useful to uh, learn for both communities. So keep it simple and start early. My activities in schools as a uh, scientific uh, ambassador in this young science program was already mentioned. So to conclude, I would say that air pollution can just be treated if we join our forces and we have a look at it at the global level. It is necessary really to rely on the knowledge and the experience of both communities to make or to keep our planet a healthy, safe and peaceful place. Thank you. I would like to sincerely thank Professor Kasper Giebel for her fascinating presentation on her work in the area of research on air, air pollution. We can clearly see that air pollution transcends national borders. It is a multifaceted problem with lots and lots of ramifications, political ramifications, economic ramifications, and also diplomatic ramifications. Uh, as Professor Kaspar Giebel um, remarked, the statistics are alarming. So the international community has to start to act uh, and uh, to fulfill the agreements 
that were concluded in many fora at the level of the European Union, but also at the level of the United Nations. And in this case, it is the United Nations Environmental Program, which is responsible for this field of action. This is a program based in Africa, in Nairobi. Professor Kaspar Giebel also mentioned the so-called ETIA program. This, uh, and if you allow me, Professor, to uh, elaborate a little bit on this academic offer, is a professional master's program, a two years program, jointly organized by the Diplomatische Akademie Wien and the Technische Universität Wien. It is an interdisciplinary program. It is organized uh, for participants who are awarded with an academic degree, a Master of Science of the TU Wien. It uh, prepares its graduates for careers as managers or as engineers, as well as for political and diplomatic tasks in the field of environment and sustainable development. Very, very much in sync, actually, with the 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Um, these graduates, at the end of their studies, can rationally assess environmental requirements and later on actively take part in the shaping of new norms. So I invite all students who wish to be active in this field a little bit later in their life um, to choose this academic program. Well, um, dear participants of this conference, I remind all of you that the floor is open for your questions. Kindly submit them in writing and we will answer them shortly. In the meantime, I would like to outline the diplomatic view on the benefits of the cooperation between diplomats on the one hand and uh, scientists on the other hand. Uh, let me... Um, explain in a few words to you uh, a quite fascinating program of the European Union, a Horizon 2020 research project titled S4D4C, using science diplomacy for addressing global challenges. This program is aimed at improving the interface between science and diplomacy and uh, also public policies. The program links 10 consortium members, universities and research centers, all of them based in the European Union. Um, it has been active for the last three years. It has come to an end recently and now comprises video material, policy briefs, research and training documents, as well as an online course, quite a successful one, which has already been used by more than 5,000 persons from all over the world and from both stakeholder groups, from scientists and from diplomats. On its homepage, you can also find case studies on cybersecurity, infectious diseases, science advice in the European Union, and many other important issues uh, related to the Sustainable Development Goals. This project has clearly shown that science diplomacy is a dynamic partnership, that science drives diplomacy and vice versa. Just a few weeks ago, Antonio Guterres, Secretary General of the United Nations, appealed to world leaders in the context of the 75th General Assembly of the United Nations to cooperate more closely and more effectively in the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic. The motto of his speech comprised the two following words, science matters. And to me, this is a clear sign that the concept of science diplomacy is recognized by the top level of diplomacy as an urgent concept and as a timely concept. What does that mean for the daily work of diplomats? Well, modern diplomats have to be all-rounders. They interact with a broad range of actors, also, of course, the scientists. Thus, a diplomatic career definitely means life 
long learning and you never have a dull moment in this career. Digitization, important issue, has reshaped the world of diplomacy in a fundamental way over the last 20 years. Nowadays, information circulates much faster than let's say 20 years ago. Big data, fake news, cybercrime, these are all rather new phenomena. And these phenomena also influence the world of diplomacy. We also have to stay on top of digital developments, in particular of the tools provided by the broad range of social media in order to respond quickly and appropriately to emerging issues. Needless to say, diplomats greatly benefit from the exchange with scientists, academics and researchers when we prepare for negotiations on issues that require knowledge and also access to scientific data and findings. And experts like Professor Karlsberg Giebel uh, are extremely, extremely important in these processes. Just one example or a few examples of um, matters that are being dealt with at an international level, international drug control, migration, nuclear safety, the question related to international fishing rights or the disappearance of endangered species. This list is almost endless and there are mandates that are negotiated at the UN and many other multilateral fora based on facts and these facts are provided by scientists. Of course, scientists also play an important role in these fora and I would also like to mention the World Health Organization or the International Atomic Energy Agency when they prepare relevant reports for delegations and negotiators to provide them with correct and fact-based material for their decisions. I would also like to underline that successful cooperation between diplomats and scientists must be based on respect for scientific integrity and I can't underline that uh, too much and also uh, it depends on solid networks between diplomats and scientists and scientists of course should also be aware of the inner workings of international fora and they should know about the procedures how decisions are taken. I'm very often asked which ways lead to science diplomacy. I would recommend, first of all, a solid academic education at a good university. After all, you also need intercultural experience and a lot of intercultural sensitivity. Internships are also helpful. Internships in diplomatic or research institutions. And then of course, one has to do a lot of learning on the job. This also implies learning foreign languages. And here in specific, you should also get acquainted with the substrata specific vocabulary used in specific environments such as Brussels. The language spoken there is called the EU talk or in New York, the UNESA. Finally, let me refer to the institution I'm representing today, the Diplomatische Akademie Wien, uh, Vienna School of International Studies. We are not only the oldest still existing diplomatic academy in the world, we also enjoy very close ties to scientific networks. We count leading scientists in the area of international relations, law, economics and history, among our teaching staff. Uh, in the context of three academic programs, a one-year diploma course and two two-year master programs uh, called the Master of Advanced International Studies and the Master on Environmental Te Technology and International Affairs, in this context, we prepare our students for leadership positions. Leader positions later on uh, in international organizations and in private business. We also organize tailor-made programs for public officials from all over the world and also from academic institutions. And in this context, science diplomacy has come to the forefront 
not only of our academic work, but also of our research output and our training uh, activities. Well, ladies and gentlemen, one question has come up for Professor Kaspar Giebel. You mentioned the Sonblick Observatory as a site for air measurements. Could you give some more information about this station? So, Professor Kasper Giebel, would you kindly respond to this question? Thank you. Yeah, I like to do that because this is really is an excellent site. Uh, the Sonblick Observatory uh, was established 100, more than 125 years ago in 1886 as a meteorological ex uh, observatory. And that time, it actually was already um, uh, an outcome of public science because it was established because scientists, meteorologists, wanted to have an observatory in a high alpine environment. But Ignaz Reuacher, who was the head of the mining activities in that region, took the chance and provided the site. And from that time on, uh, it was first, it was permanently staffed. Just for a few days, the measurements had to be stopped. Uh, but it is permanently in operation, starting with metrology and then with air chemistry. Air chemistry measurements were largely extended in 1980s with the reconstruction of the observatory. And now it is part of international networks. One network that's very important for air chemistry is the Global Atmosphere Watch Network. And there, uh, Somblik is a global station together with two other observatories at the high elevation. It's the Jungfrau Joch in Switzerland and Hohen Bessenberg in Germany. So there are other environments as well, of course, conducting this type of research. The big chance of the Somblik is the close connection to the cryosphere with the glaciers, to the biosphere and to the atmosphere. So this is a bit of an outline and uh, an international activity that's just established now is this ACTRIS network I mentioned already. Uh, ACTRIS stands for aerosol, clouds and trace gases research infrastructure. And this is a really joint a pan-European network to improve the measurements and the availability of data of high quality and monitoring data. So data not just restricted to measurement campaigns and rather short time series, but to really a monitoring program being extensive and available to the whole scientific and public community. So I hope these were some more informations, but you can find other informations uh, on the web. Uh, if you look for the Somblik Observatory, it's operated by the ZAMC, but a lot of other uh, institutions work there and make it to the unique station. Thank you very much, Professor Kaspar Giebel. So research can also, also be done at very high up places. There's another question uh, which has come up. Can scientists become fully fledged diplomats? Well, this is a question that comes up very often when students uh, wish to shape their future careers. And I could respond to that question with a clear yes. Many ways, as I mentioned before, lead uh, to becoming a uh, science diplomat. Uh, many scientists are seconded to ministries as science advisors to ministers, to prime ministers, presidents, sometimes to parliaments. That would be one way. Or there are students who already work as scientists after graduation and only then decide to start a diplomatic career. So this is also possible in the context of the Austrian foreign ministry. For example, we have one medical doctor who later also studied law and became a diplomat. So also a combination of uh, expertise can be very, very helpful in this case. Um, so it is an interesting career choice. 
you have many different ways to approach this and I can only encourage everybody to have a look at this model. Well, I can see another question that should be directed to Professor Kasper Giebel. Question on how COVID-19, very, very burning issue, has changed the air quality in Austria. So COVID-19 and the air quality in Austria, interesting combination. Would you kindly respond to that question? Yes. Uh can uh, give some comments about that. Uh, air quality was affected in Austria, like in other countries. Uh, the most pronounced effects, of course, could be found in those regions where uh, air pollution really uh, finds a very high level. But in Austria, you could see it all the same, especially during the weeks of the lockdown. So when traffic uh, was reduced all over uh, Austria. It depends if you really want to look at the impact, it depends on the pollutant you look at. If you look at the nitrogen oxides, a compound strongly related to traffic, then you find really strong decrease of those concentration values. But to evaluate that in detail, it's very important not to compare uh, big averages, but to look at days with similar meteorological conditions. Because the air concentrations, the ambient concentrations you have depends on the emission flux, but always also on the meteorology, on the dispersion, on the dilution. So uh, a very uh, detailed investigation should be here, but on the whole, for the nitrogen oxides, you really could find a strong reduction during these weeks. It was less visible, but still visible for particulate matter. Particulate matter has various sources, and therefore you find that reduction not that pronounced, but you can find it. So even in Austria, with a really good uh, air quality on a general, you could see a positive impact during those weeks. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, I'm sure that a lot of research is right now being done on this, on this interesting question. And I think we are all looking forward to the outcome of this research and maybe also use our bicycles more than we use our cars in daily life, of course, if not too cold outside. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think we have uh, approached the end of our time for this conference. Um, let me invite Professor Kasper Giebel for her final recommendation on our topic, science diplomacy. Frau Professor? Yes, for a final statement, I just want to encourage uh, all scientists to be open to other communities, to approach diplomats, because this is really a unique chance to have their findings uh, included in negotiations and to build a better future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frau Professor Kasper Giebel, for your expertise, for your final recommendation. The diplomats will take it at heart. My final recommendation would be that science and diplomacy are attached at the hips. So let us join forces for a healthy planet and sustainable livelihoods. Thank you all the participants for your partic participation and stay safe and healthy. Goodbye. <laughs>